The opinions expressed on the Custody Queen Show are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for personal, professional legal advice. The persons discussed are fictional and not based on actual clients. Thought it was love, had kids in between. You can count on us with the custody queens. Yeah, you can count on us with the custody queens. Good morning, everyone. We made it to Saturday. Hallelujah. Happy weekend. <laughs> I don't know about you guys listening, but it sure has been a long week. Feels like Monday to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you only get to really enjoy Saturday of the weekend because around 3 p.m. on Sunday, that's when all of the stress actually starts kicking in for Monday. My husband always tells me he can just see in my expression once we're at that point on Sunday. Yeah, I think I like Friday better than Saturday. I already have like Monday anxiety by Saturday. Yeah. But I, I, this is my favorite part of the day. <laughs> so welcome everybody. I hope you guys are all having a good day. And uh, I hope you're enjoying a nice cup of coffee with your favorite blonde girls, the Custody Queens. And today we have Dane Holstrom, Certified Family Law Specialist and the Divorce Authority. He's also a resident guest on our Custody Queens radio show. So welcome, Dane. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Well, thanks again for having me. It's been a little while. I know, I know. It's been a few months, so we thought we'd bring you back. And uh, we're going to title our show today called There's Always One. And the point of that is we kind of want to go back over the last 30 years of you practicing law and building this, you know, empire, this business and being a huge part of our Custody Queens team. And we're going to find out what case kind of brought tears to your eyes, what case taught you a lesson that you'll never forget. And we got a few more questions up our sleeves. Yeah, sleep. we're going to ask Dane a bunch of questions that he's not prepared for. So that's how this morning's going to go. <laughs> Everyone grab a cup of coffee. Before we jump in, though, I did want to do a kind of fun segment. Um, I want to ask Kristen and Dane about a celebrity quote. I'm going to say it, and I want to know which one of you or if either of you can guess who said it. All right? Okay, so here's the quote. I heard one lawyer say, no one wins in court. It's just a matter of who gets hurt worse. And it seems to be true. You just spend a year just focused on building a case to prove your point and why you're right and why they're wrong. And it's just an investment in vitriolic hatred. I just refuse. And fortunately, my partner in this agrees. It's just very jarring for the kids to suddenly have their family ripped apart. Any guesses? Well, I'm thinking of the most high conflict celebrity divorce cases, which would probably bring rise to either Brad Pitt or Kanye West. Neither one, because that one was resolved and neither one of those two were resolved. Yeah, that's true. They did. That's somebody who saw the light. <laughs> okay, Dane, Dane, who's your guess? Acrimonious divorce for somebody who said I'm done. I don't know, there's probably a couple of those. So I'm happy to say that Kristen was right. Brad Pitt. Ha! <laughs> I knew as soon as I read it on the card before we sat down, I said Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie because I think that I read in one of my you know gossip magazines the amount of money that they had spent on their case, and I think one of them had I think it was Angelina had been through like five attorneys. Wow. Well, that, that brings up kind of a tragic point is that regards as how we as attorneys try to always open our clients' eyes up to collateral damage that can happen from a hard-fought divorce. I mean, there's times you fight and fight because you need to fight it, but there's other times when you're fighting and fight for some other reason and you lose sight of the collateral damage, whether it's financial, harm to the children, whatever, and part of our job as attorneys is to point that out. And kudos to Mr. Pitt um, for, for publicly acknowledging that that does in fact exist. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more, and I think it's important for everyone to, you know, whether it's weekly, monthly, every couple of months, kind of check in with yourself and evaluate why you're doing the things you're doing and where you need to go. And things change throughout a divorce. You may feel very passionately one way at the beginning and feel very different at the end. So we want to keep it as, as streamless as possible to the extent that we can. Yeah, one of the conversations I have with my clients periodically throughout my representation, and I know Sam and Dane do this too, is like Sam just said, your priorities change. So when you're 
newly separated and you're emotional and you're still trying to process this new transition in your life and co-parenting and, and everything that goes along with it, you're very emotional. And so decisions are often based off your emotions. Now, fast forward six months to a year into the process, you might have got you know some help, you might have going through therapy, you might see what really matters the most and your priorities change. And it's important for you to have that conversation with your attorney. When clients want me to file a motion or you know do something like take a deposition, you always go over the financial cost that is associated with that motion or that process. And then you ask your client, how important is this to you and what will we get from doing that act? Yeah, why are you doing it? That's a really important point. You don't just want to make litigation expensive and costly and draining because it drains everyone. So you want to make sure that you're doing things for a purpose and that you have a plan always. What do you have to add on that, Dane? Well, that all of those things are true, and part of our job as attorneys is to take a posture. There are attorneys who have brands and reputations that are very, very different. Uh, we all know, and we'll all think of this person, you know, and it'll be a different person too. Who's that litigator that you hate to go up against because they just make it so draining? They fight over everything for no apparent reason, and they, cost is no object, time is no object, but that's their rep. Right. And some people will now hire that family law attorney because they they've heard that they that they're loud in court that they <laughs> that they scream you know that the knuck the brass knuckles are their brand you know identifier yeah and that that person that hires that particular attorney should not be confused when they're in protracted exhausting financially stressful litigation because that is you know the the collateral outcome of that yeah and, and part of our job is always to counsel our clients about uh, we talked about the, the collateral damage, the cost, and it, the, the scary words that I hear sometimes from clients are, it's the principle of the thing. And and when I get a client that says to me, it's the principle of the thing, uh, I, I literally, I call timeout, and I say, let's let's look at this, okay? If it's a financial matter, this is, this is a balance sheet. Right. This is, are you gonna spend $200,000 to try to get $50,000? Because that's a really bad idea. Right. And we need to counsel our clients that that's a bad idea. Conversely, if it comes down to child safety and somebody is absolutely convinced that this is a risk of physical harm, that's when you've got to follow your client's direction right. until you have reason not to. Um, in other words, you find out your client's not being honest with you or something like that. But otherwise, part of our job as advocates is to advocate for our clients because we believe in their cases. And so we don't necessarily get to say, I, I'm not going to follow that path unless we believe it's not supportable or justifiable or we think it's contrary to our clients and their children's own interests. I, I agree 100%. You might not want to fight over that crock pot, ladies and gentlemen. I, 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 we all know if you've listened to these shows that I have had cases where, you know, a crock pot has been at issue. And I think I even went and bought my client a new crock pot just you know, to say that this is going to be the most expensive crock pot you're ever going to get, but let's let the issue go. On the other hand, you have domestic violence, you have a legitimate safety concern. Clearly, that is your priority and that is the most important. I think every experienced family law attorney has bought several crock pots in their life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm a crock pot connoisseur. Kristen is. <laughs> How many crock pots do you have, Kristen? Oh, about four. Okay, my crock pot was a metaphor, so you guys are going <laughs> oh, no, a different I, path. I'm actually yeah. saying I have bought my client a crock pot. But <laughs> I don't cook much, but what I do cook is in a crock pot. All right, now, of my 20 years, 20 plus years of working for the Divorce Authority, I have had the joy and pleasure of following him around in court, watching him litigate and do trials, and just really being able to learn from him on how he communicates with clients, how you deliver bad news, how you separate the line from being a friend and an attorney when you're representing someone that you have a personal relationship with, all of those issues come up. And so I want Dane to tell us kind of about the few cases that have left a scar on him, whether it's personally, you know, physically or emotionally. So Dane, has there been one case in your 30 years that has just, you've never been able to kind of let go of mentally? Uh, when you say let go of, uh, one of the challenges I had early in my career, probably lasted for at least 10 years, I don't know if we get to that point, 
where every single case that you were so passionate about, and you were such a, a dedicated advocate that you're up at two o'clock in the morning thinking about this client and this case and their kids, and then you realize, wow, I care more about their kids than they do. It's like you know, you have that epiphany, and then you create that barrier, that buffer, if you will, between your objective thoughts and analysis and your advocacy, and that's when you really become a professional advocate. And that's when you become a better lawyer, is you're able to set aside your own emotional thoughts and make sure that you, you need to be empathetic with the client, understand what's going on, what's making them tick, what's driving their emotions. But you've also got to say to say, be able to say again, time out, and go through it. So the answer is, of course, I have. I've had I've had a lot of those cases, but I also use the word scars as a metaphor. And you've heard me talk about this before.、Um, and I'm I'm going to have to insert quote here. One of my favorite quotes is, "Experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted." I like that. And it's it's my favorite quote because it's so true. Is you always walk away from an experience with experience, with knowledge, and and when you walk away with it because you didn't get what you wanted, you didn't win. You learn a heck of a lot more than when you win. And and when you prevail, because then you might dust aside that mistake. If you end up winning anyway or doing well, you might dust aside that mistake. But it's the ones that you learn from that you walk away with. The scars, as I tell all of the attorneys that I talk to, are what we carry with us into the next case and the next case. And I've done that in my case for over 30 years, so I got a lot of scars. Yeah, no, I, I do too. <laughs> I remember、uh, very early on in my career, you know, probably a year of practicing and, and learning every single time I went to court. You know, where to sit, what to wear, when to talk, you know, not to swear yourself in, all that good stuff. <laughs> and I remember calling Dane one time, kind of in the corner, you know, almost on the verge of like a, a panic attack or a nervous breakdown because I didn't know how to handle that exact issue and. And、uh, Dane Bing, you know, the the hard parent slash、uh, boss that he is, you know, guided me to be able to not fall apart, fake it till I make it, and actually kind of address the issue with the court. Now inside, I was freaking out, and I think I cried after the hearing. <laughs>、um, but it it those you don't learn really from winning. You learn from all of the times that you are defeated. And I was trying to tell my daughter. I was explaining this to her over the weekend. Is you know she's had a kind of a, a little bit of a transition year with soccer, and my daughter is very visual. She has to do something over and over and over to get it. And、uh, with that said, she's kind of been a sub on her soccer team. And over the last two three weeks, we've been doing privates, doing everything I can to have her process and learn. You're one of those parents. <laughs> she is. I, I am. I, I wish I could just be that parent that was like, oh, I'm so happy you're on the team. You know, but she said to me the other day, she was, "Mom, I'm finally getting it. I've learned so much." And I try to tell her that had we not been in this position, because my daughter's a natural athlete, so generally whatever she does, she's good at, and she has had to really work to be a better soccer player. And I was telling her, we learn from the things that we don't do right initially. Every time we do it, we get a little bit better, and whatever that is, communication,、uh, you know. Just really anything in life. It's it's the times that we fail that we actually learn. Yeah, and let me tell you a little something about Kristen being an all-star mom in general, but an all-star soccer mom because Kristen invited me to Riley's soccer game not that long ago, and it was just up the street from my house, and I showed up. And at first I couldn't see Kristen, and I was like, was she at the bathroom? I don't know. But then I I quickly located her. Take, literally on one knee, screaming, and just the most passionate coach parent I've ever seen in my life, and it was hysterical. It absolutely was. But Kristen, Kristen does everything 110%. If you know that about Kristen, that is very true. So I, I can't imagine her being any other way. Well, I, I learned. How to be a parent from my parent next to me.、Uh, so you know, my dad coached me for many years playing soccer, and it's funny because you know he'd make me go run laps during practice, and I would have a few choice words as I was running the laps. And it's funny because Riley gets very frustrated with and, me. And how did you do in soccer, dear? <laughs> <laughs> I was very successful, but I, you know, <laughs> I have those same conversations, and I'm sure Riley has choice words for me as well. Yeah, like I said, poor Riley. She's third generation getting it. So,、yeah. <laughs> All right. So, when, Dane, when I say one of those cases that you let go of, is there is there a case you had that 
even though you were able to put your emotions aside, that you may still think about today? Oh yeah, I, again, whenever I get to similar circumstances or similar client experiences, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to talk about specific you know, people or cases and stuff like that, but they're very clear in my head. And there, it, it really does, it's the most important thing that I've learned is don't charge ahead you know, in, in your advocacy without stopping to talk to your client and make sure that you understand that the path that you're on is the path that, that they want to go down. Um, because sometimes you find out that they really hadn't thought about it. Nobody gave them an option. They didn't think about it. Um, and the Brad Pitt example is a very good one. You know, it's, it's I had one case with a client, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, but the, the, the only child of the relationship was like 15 or 16. And there was a high, high, high degree of, and this word is thrown out like candy at Halloween, uh, alienation. Um, it is also a technical term with technical foundations and uh, psychological underpinnings. And there was a high amount of alienation in this case. And it was so clear to me that this child was so damaged um, by what was going on that I took my client aside and I said, I want you to think long and hard about what you're doing here because you may prove your case and lose your daughter. And, uh, and he thought about it and he came back to me and, and we changed direction. And I, that always sticks with me. Yeah, I, I watched Dane uh, in that trial. I was a new attorney. And it so was, you know which one I'm talking I, about. I do. I okay. do. It's and, a lot. <laughs> yeah, Sam, Sam actually got to watch too. And it was one of those cases that even if we won on paper, you know, with the court making a finding that we were looking for, that we needed, the client was still losing uh, because the child was so damaged, as Dane said. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I really do believe that that buffer between your client and you is so important because if you go down the road with them and you match their emotion, then you can't, as an advocate, really see clearly where things could be going. And so it's our job as attorneys to be able to take a step back. And it, it, it's not to hurt your feelings. Uh, trust me, I'm, I'm too emotionally involved. But, but taking a step back is needed and necessary so that you, are, as the emotional client or parent or wife or husband, can make a decision that logistically makes sense. Because if everyone's just running on emotions and you're going to get to a situation where a lot of attorney fees are spent for no reason um, and you're tied up in litigation and, and you just can't get back to normal because we want you to get out of the divorce situation, out of the custody situation, out of these orders so that you can go have lives that don't exist with calling your attorney every day. And we do have, uh, Sam and I, uh, we have probably about 10 clients that we have had between five and eight years. Uh, and we have built a relationship, obviously, with these clients that, you know, I see sometimes these people as my clients and also my friend outside of our representation. But even with that said, hard conversations still have to, have to happen from the attorney. So if your attorney is not giving you information and giving you an option, I would suggest that you get a second opinion. You know, when I, when I tell a client, here's what I believe your options are, it's your life, Dane taught me this. How do we? How do you want to navigate? Because at the end of the day, I can advocate for you. I can do my best in court. But this is your life. You have to live with what happens. So if I suggest a restraining order because I believe that abuse has occurred, I want to make sure my client understands financially the cost of this process, what your children might go through during this process, and how it may affect your case as a whole. It's not just your case, but your life. In other words, we have, particularly you hit on domestic violence, is that we often have uh, really very unhealthy codependent relationships between victims and accusers. And the victim may say, so-and-so did this horribly violent thing. And we say, wow, we need to get a, re a restraining order. And then we explain to them that that means that you're gonna have to confront them in court, and da 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 da, -da. Very often, that's a very traumatic experience, or they're scared uh, that, you know, again, the, the victims sometimes get into the self-blaming situation. And then the most important thing you think is, we need to help you get, get some mental health, some therapy, to help you understand what's going on, to help you get the tools that you need to be able to deal with the situation. And that is probably the most important thing you can do for that client in that circumstance making sure they're physically safe of course but making sure they can deal with going from being a victim to not being a victim 
that's very true. And, and a lot of attorneys just do things. I was recently in court and um, it was one of those cases where husband and wife or soon to be ex, they were actually friends, you know, going through this process. And, you know, the dad had made an allegation in, in the motion and my client asked him, well, well, why did you put that? And he goes, oh, I didn't even read it. So, you know, it, it is very important that you know what is being done on your behalf. Our clients are very involved in our process. For instance, if we, we assist with the writing of a narrative, you know, to file a motion for custody or visitation, you provide us with the facts, then we send it back to you for review. So that way we are all on the same page. But a lot of attorneys, they just, they just march ahead and file things and it affects your life. That is not the attorney's life, that is your life. So make sure that you are equally as involved in the process. Yeah, what happens is you find out that the attorney totally miswrote something that you told them about, and then they sent you an email that said, sign it and get it back to me. I gotta file it in half an hour. Mm -hmm. Or they sign, you know, e-sign it from their phone without even reading it. And, and then you find out that the statement's not true. Well, guess what? You're probably gonna fire that attorney, which means you live with that false statement that you gave to the court and the attorney's on down to the next case. Sam, you want to say something? Yeah, no, and I, I think that that's all true. And I think that whenever you are filing something with a court or whenever you are going through the divorce process, you want to be as involved as your attorney. You want to ask the questions. And when you're filing something like a declaration, it's really important if something isn't true or isn't accurate that you correct it lifetime because one of the biggest things that you can lose in court, and if you do, it's tragic to your case, is your credibility. You lose your credibility, you're, it, it's really hard to say, no judge, this time I'm not lying, believe me, right? The court has already lost it. So I think that is a really good point. All right, I have another question for Dane. Have you ever had a client or a case that taught you a really valuable life lesson? should have prepped me for this one. <laughs> we told you we weren't gonna prep No you. prep. <laughs> like, Dane, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> I know there's a few cases and clients that, that have probably humbled you in some way and taught you something. Hum the humility um, comes from, number one, we, we have a really good team. Um, and all of our staff at, at HPP and Custody Queens, we've just, that's what makes us good attorneys. In fact, we've got a great team. So that's where the humility comes from, is knowing that I couldn't do what I do without having that team behind me. So I don't know that a, a specific case, I've had clients that, that have been very, very grateful. And obviously I'm very, very humble when they say literally just a meaningful, very heartfelt thank you. Um, that, that, that means everything. Um, and we, get, we do what we do, it's, it's our professions, it's our careers, it's how we earn a living. Um, but yes, you know, having, you know, it's, it's family law is not one of those things where you get a lot of that. And candidly, I think your, both of your guys' interpersonal relationships with your clients and, and how close you really are to them is something that's very, very valuable. And that's something that speaks of a different generation, frankly. So you know, kudos to you guys. Yeah. My, my clients have definitely taught me things over the years. You know, I can, I can say one thing that a specific client taught me. Uh, is um, she's a she's a client that's been with Sam and I for a very long time, but sometimes you just can't fix crazy, you know. And uh, I, I don't know how other how <laughs> another way to say it that may be more PC, but you know, dealing in family law, we have a lot of people that do some crazy things. Okay, and, uh, and sometimes they're our clients. Yeah, and sometimes they are our clients. <laughs> where Sam and I are doing damage control and trying to make the best of a not so great situation and sometimes they're not and no matter what Sam and I can do to protect this client and you know get safety measures in place sometimes you just can't fix crazy and I think that specific client taught me that you know um, and she's been with us for a long time and she is so incredibly grateful that the long hours the 2 a.m. wake up calls it really does make it worth it. And in that case, you're talking about the other side. Yes, I am talking Just about the. I am talking about the other side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hence the eight-year relationship, right? That, yeah. You know, we've had. No, I mean it, it's true, and a lot of times clients will get in their own way, or you know, Kristen and I have quite a few clients that we you know have tried and tried to help, and sometimes you can't because they they don't want to 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 look at a situation a particular way, and that's unfortunate. But I think what keeps Kristen and I and probably Dane going is 
look, we're not in family law. Yes, we make a living doing it, but we're not in family law to make a living. At least that's not what, I, there's plenty of other ways to make money, right? It's, it's the passion I have towards it. It's the passion I have towards my clients that keeps me going. Like it's the reason I can answer your text on a Saturday or a Sunday because I, I do care and I, I want to help genuinely. And Kristen, I, I know feels exactly the same. Note to self, Sam is getting too much money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we do have a client email um, that I'm going to read to Sam and Dane, and then we can kind of get their feedback. This is a question that we get fairly often. So I'm just going to read this, and then you guys can give me your input. Before you do that, I want to just do just to make a point on behalf of your listening audience. I know they all would like to hear Dane do the trivia questions. Did you get rid of the trivia questions because I, I nailed because them all? Because you've lost so many times I, that we didn't want to embarrass you again. We wanted to give you a week off from losing. We know how game. uncomfortable uh, it got filming last time because you lost like three for three. Okay, I have the transcript. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm sorry, go ahead. All right, listeners, let's see if Dane can get this one right. All right, just kidding. Client email from Georgia in Eagle Rock. My ex hasn't been around our son for five years. He is seven years old now and barely remembers him. Can I change his last name back to mine? Are you asking from a legal perspective? Yes. Yeah. Well, first off, there's a whole bunch of facts missing, such as were they married? Um, is there a affidavit of paternity and all these things? Something to establish legally the parent-child relationship between the absentee father. Um, are there any court orders that might inhibit your ability to do that? Um, and if neither one of those are true, then yeah, go change the name. Um, so uh, for for explanation sake, if she if this person had an order that she had sole legal and sole physical custody of the child, could she change his last name to hers? If there's a court order, my belief is you would probably still have to ask the court for permission because having sole legal custody does not give you a right to ipso facto change the child's name. It gives you the right to make legal decisions affecting the child. But I think changing the identity would be going a little far uh, without uh, getting court approval or consent. Yes, and I do just want to remind everyone that the laws are different in every state. So if you are listening in a state that is not California, you obviously would want to talk to an attorney in the state that you live in. All right. I have one last question, Dane. Is there, you know, we were talking about earlier, or one of our last shows recently, that the, the pandemic feels like it's been going on forever. I still remember the three weeks, you know, slow the spread. That was when I was having a baby. Um, but is there, you know, is there something you've learned from the last year and a half? Or is there something enlightening? You know, did you have a WTF moment? Like... Well, as it relates to COVID, basically, it's like it, 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 this is rapidly becoming the new normal. And it's changed things in court. It's changed things in family law. And I think some of those changes are never going back, like video court hearings, I think, are going to be largely the new normal. Uh, and what we, we resisted them until we realized, oh, hell, I can get a lot more done this way. Um, but there's times you really do want your client and, and their face and their body language to be in front of the judge. And so we have to make those kind of decisions on a more case-by-case -case basis than we ordinarily might because it's a lot easier to do it by Zoom, but it may not be the best for your client. Agreed. All right, so we have to wrap it up. And uh, we always love having the divorce authority on. There is no greater mind than Dane Holstrom to walk us through the divorce process. He has trained Sam and I, and I think that we teach him just a few things as well. So Dane, thank you for coming on and spoiling our listeners for a little bit of the last 30 years. And we will make sure to bring trivia back next time. <laughs> okay, okay. I, will, I know you're gonna try to stop me. I will literally Google the hardest questions you know to find but Dane always knows like the weirdest things you know it's like he wouldn't get the celebrity question right but he'll know I don't know something weird 
<laughs> All right, everyone. Well, that wraps up today. Don't forget to join us every Saturday at 8.30 a.m. on Go Country 105. And make sure you follow us on social media. We are always doing giveaways on Instagram. So make sure you follow us. Look for our Tuesday tips. And make sure you call in at 1-800-419-7772. That's 1-800-419-7772. And thank you for joining us today. And always remember, let, let love rule. rule.